Welcome to Vax Facts, a special series of the Aaron Harbor Show. Our goal is to create a place where you can get hard facts without any political bias and ask any questions you want about COVID-19. Please encourage everyone you know to watch our program or listen to our podcast. Every episode will be available in both forms. And whenever you have any questions about COVID or any of the vaccines being offered, email questions at harbortv.com and we will do our best to get answers to them, which we will address right on this program. Any question you have is welcome, so don't be shy. My guest today is Dr. Sean O'Leary. Dr. O'Leary is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and Children's Hospital, Colorado. He's a pediatric infectious diseases specialist. His research focuses on prevention of vaccine preventable diseases through understanding clinical, attitudinal, and infrastructural barriers to vaccination and developing and testing interventions to address those barriers. Sean, welcome to the show. Thanks, glad to be here. So you know, one of the first things I wanted to talk about with you is, is uh, of course, your specialty in, in the arena of, of pediatric medicine. Uh, but tell me a little bit more about what you've been doing related to COVID-19 so the audience understands how extensive your background really is in this specific topic. Yeah, I, I mean, it seems like both yesterday and years ago that this whole pandemic started. But uh, yeah, so starting really in, in January when we first started to hear about this, as you might imagine, as an infectious diseases specialist, um, it, it things got busy and uh, we, you know, uh, both at a local level and, and regional level and then, and then a national level as well. Um, I, I think just about every infectious diseases specialist I know uh, took on some extra responsibilities. My emails have tripled, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, at the start, it was planning. You know, there, there were few cases in the U.S. and so it was trying to figure out infection control procedures at our hospital. Uh, trying to get as much information as we could uh, about the virus uh, at an early stage to be able to educate our, our colleagues as well as uh, the, the community of uh, pr both primary care providers who are going to be taking care of patients as well as um, uh, educating the, the general public. So that started, you know, February, March, uh, that we really started to get into gear with those kinds of things. And then, of course, um, as the pandemic has progressed, uh, <laughs> It's just been, you know, one thing after another, really. So um, thinking back on it, one of the things I remember that, that I was uh, very involved when, with early on was that as soon as the shutdown happened, uh, the dramatic drop in um, patient visits to primary care offices. And, you know, some of that was out of, uh, there, were, there was less virus circulating of, of other respiratory viruses. Uh, but also people were afraid to go to the doctor. And so what that translated to was a lot of uh, children missing their, their checkups and missing out on their vaccinations. And so myself and a number of others here in Colorado uh, and, and also around the country noticed this, this precipitous, precipitous drop in vaccinations early on, and we had to address that. So that was, that was one of the early things that, that came up as a kind of an indirect result of, of the virus itself. Um, I've also been pretty involved with, with education around um, uh, this, this virus, uh, several aspects of it. I, I guess I would say um, I've been helping a lot in uh, both uh, regionally in, in Colorado and surrounding states with, with trying to keep our uh, community of primary care providers up to date on uh, the, the latest information related to uh, the virus. Myself and a, and a group of colleagues at Children's Hospital Colorado have a town hall, sometimes every week, sometimes every other week, where several hundred, sometimes over a thousand uh, primary care physicians will uh, join the meeting to get educated. I've also done uh, some of that for the uh, nationally for the American Academy of Pediatrics, providing educational venues there as well. So that's that's been a busy part of this, and that that stuff has continued uh, throughout this pandemic. Um, other things that I've been fairly intimately involved with uh, throughout, one was, was related to the school guidance. So I'm on a committee uh, for the American Academy of Pediatrics called the uh, Committee on Infectious Diseases. 
So our committee uh, crafts infectious diseases policy for pediatricians in the US and, and the policies that we create are actually often used around the world. Um, we, we have a, a publication called the Red Book, which has been in, in production since the 1930s, comes out, it's, it's uh, revised in print form every three years, but we're constantly updating it. That, that uh, publication is used throughout the world to guide infectious diseases policy for children. So you can imagine uh, what that means during a pandemic. Uh, we've been meeting quite frequently and uh, helping to craft the policy. So I got involved fairly early on in helping to graph, uh, helping to craft policies around uh, uh, schools and in-person learning and that kind of thing. So that that was very busy. Similarly, with my role uh, within the world of vaccines, I've been working. I mean, as a primary care pediatrician way back when, I was you know of course giving vaccines a lot and talking with families a lot. Since I I did a, a fellowship, gosh. Uh, starting in 2007, I've also been involved in uh, research around vaccines. And so uh, in that role, I, I have a couple of, of um, titles uh, regarding, so I'm, I'm a liaison to the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices for the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. So the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is the is the policy that's affiliated with CDC? They're non-CDC employees, but advise the CDC that that makes recommendations about vaccines for the U.S. population. And so I've been involved with that committee for several years. Um, I'm also the AAP's representative to uh, the the COVID-19 vaccine work group. So that's, that's a, a work group that works within the ACIP to help advise the ACIP on those policies. So as you can imagine, I've been, I've been kind of busy through all this. So those yeah. are, that's just a, an overview of kind of the stuff I've been working on. All right, that's great. You know, one of the questions that a lot of people have, and there's still a lot of debate on this, which really surprises me, is the science of masks, of wearing masks, where you have such a significant percentage of the population uh, just really being resistant to wearing a mask. And uh, certainly one of the problems was early in the process, uh, in, in the spring of, of 2020, uh, we were advised, the public was advised to not go out and buy masks, not wear masks. Uh, and, and I know the motivation behind that was to try to keep the supply available for the healthcare and medical people that needed it. Uh, but the message that masks weren't effective seems to me to be taking the wrong approach. What, what's your take on, on what was done uh, from a national perspective, but also uh, just inform, informing people uh, about the science of masks and how much they protect uh, other people and uh, to what extent they protect the person wearing a mask? Yeah, so the, the mixed messaging that, that sort of happened early on with the, the mask issue is, is certainly problematic. You know, one of my observations throughout the, this pandemic is that the public really hasn't been alerted enough to the fact that things are going to change and they're going to change quickly as we learn more. Um, you know, science doesn't, science, but that's how science should happen is we find something uh, to be true and we change our course because we have found out something new. And when you're in the midst of a pandemic, that can be really tricky because you, you get these you know, strongly crafted public health messages going out there and then all of a sudden you have to change them. But I, I think we all have to get used to that and have to recognize that. And, and I've seen that really play out across a lot of the, the policy that we've seen, you know, thinking specifically about schools. You know, we've learned we've been learning more and more about how to handle things in schools as time has gone on and we have to be able to change. Um, but change is hard, um, but we have to get used to it. So the, the mask issue is, I think, that probably the best example of that is people are pointing back to, you know, March saying, well, they said masks don't work. And well, you know what? That was the message at the time. People thought perhaps they didn't early on. Uh, and then there was the concern about trying to preserve masks. Uh, but the, the fact is they do. And so, you know, it depends on which study you look at, but uh, pretty much across the board uh, with, with a few exceptions, places where people are wearing masks consistently show less transmission than places where people are not wearing masks. Um, and 
Initially, we thought that wearing masks was simply for t to protect others if we were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic with COVID and, and uh, could, it could prevent it from spreading it to another person. We've since learned it's probably uh, almost certainly protective for the person wearing the mask as well. Uh, we're learning more and more about which masks work and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so things may, may still change from here, but, but the evidence is fairly clear. Uh, you know, people that, that you know, there, there's certainly been the problem of people just denying the existence of the pandemic, right? And, and so that's also a real challenge around this. So people refusing to wear masks, not because they think, they think they don't work, but because they don't believe in the pandemic in the first place. And, and I don't know what you do about that. All right. Well, that's a that's a huge issue. We can and we can uh, address that. What about sticking uh, with the subject of masks just for uh, a second? What about the statistical difference? I mean, have you looked at uh, the impact of masking in states where you have st a statewide masking mandate or where the major communities have a mandate versus states that don't have a mandate? Yeah, there's. Um I have not seen a systematic study across the country where they've looked at that. It may be out there and I just haven't seen it yet, but there was a good example out of Kansas where they showed um, in communities where there was a mask mandate, less transmission than in ones where there weren't. That, that's one example of uh, among many studies that have, have shown examples that, re, you know, regarding the effectiveness of masks. And, and it, you know, in some, it, it's a little tricky because in some places uh, where there's a, so mandates do appear to work, I, I will say that. But uh, the other thing I would point out is that it also has to do with the public health messaging around it. So there's some places where the, the mandates are out there, but there's not very high uptake within the population versus other places where there may not be a mandate, but the, the public health messaging has been strong. And so most people are wearing masks. And so it gets a little muddy in terms of looking at those things. But when you actually look at the studies where people are wearing masks versus where people aren't, it's clear that they, they help, inter help interrupt the transmission. Well, certainly different countries and territories have had great success uh, suppressing or even uh, eliminating as a major threat COVID-19 uh, where mask mandates uh, are a requirement. You also have societies where wearing a mask is something a lot of people in the population were doing before uh, COVID, yeah. that, that they simply, you know, that's something that they, they see as making, making sense. Uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, different factors. I mean, when you compare states, when, when I recently looked at uh, all 50 states in terms of uh, infection rates or number of cases, uh, out of the top 31 states, five were what would be considered blue states, 26 uh, were red states. So you had uh, this potential correlation that the states who have been resisting any kind of uh, measures or, or ex the more extreme measures like lockdowns, et cetera, uh, are now suffering more than, than uh, other states. So uh, that statistic, those numbers uh, surprised me uh, as well. But, but also, you know, point to the possibility that, or, or you know, the may, may help confirm that taking some severe measures when things are out of control is really uh, all you can do. But there, there are also a lot of factors, that, and I want to talk about that in terms of science. Uh, you know, different states have dispersal of populations uh, in different ways. The uh, homogeneity of populations varies, you know, where they're located, density, uh, a lot of different facts. Climate uh, all, all play different roles. So it's not always easy just to say, you know, because a state, you know, is a red state or a blue state that it's going to have, you know, a particular uh, particular result when it comes to COVID. But you mentioned science, and, and as a scientist, I mean, I, I'd be really interested um, in your perspective as a scientist uh, about the whole issue of science. And one of the things that you talked about that, that you referenced was the fact that, that science evolves, that, uh, that you, you come to initial conclusions and with initial data, and you, as you get more data, if the data tells you no, what you thought before was wrong, you need to to, ch to change tracks. Two things. One is um, a, a lot of people in our society seem to have a tremendous difficulty making those kind of track changes. Uh, uh, when, when confronted with data that contradicts uh, what they were thinking or believing, uh, they seem to, to really be, uh, you know, hold their positions almost immutably. I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. And I'd also like you to talk a little bit about uh, the fact that we've done such a poor job of educating people about how science works. 
uh, so that they can understand you know, what these processes are. And uh, I'd, I'd like your take on, on both of those. Yeah, so that, <laughs> a lot to talk about there. So, you know, the, the assault on science really has been going on for decades. And, you know, some of it is, you know, probably politically motivated, right? The, the challenge to climate science, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, in, in, I'm not a behavioral scientist, but in, in my world of working with vaccines and studying vaccine hesitancy, I've, I've you know, tried to learn as much as I can about it. And, and, and one of the thing, one of the, the principles is that, you know, people tend to accept things um, without much scrutiny that fits in with their worldview. But they will, if, if, their, if their worldview is challenged by facts, they will dismiss those facts. They'll try and attack the messenger. There are various ways that, that those facts get dismissed, but that's human nature. Um, and, and we all do that to one degree or another. And I think we have to recognize that. And, and so people do have these, these built-in biases, biases that uh, are um, gonna make it difficult to, to change traje trajectories with their, when they have a, a very deeply held belief. Um, the, the, you know, some, just to touch on something you, you mentioned about the red state, blue state issue. I mean, I think one of the historic tragedies of this pandemic, I, I think that, that really will go down in history as almost uniquely American is the way that it was approached uh, it, and, and how, how you responded to the pandemic fell on party lines. And so you have a large swath of the U.S. population that, you know, essentially was, was resisting the science, resisting uh, the, the um, directives, because that was the way their lead, the leaders of their political party were going. And, we, you know, that we, we're seeing the results of that. The U.S. has more deaths than, than any other country, not just based on proportion of the population, period. I mean, U.S. represents like 5% of the world or something like that. And we're, you know, way more than that in terms of percentage of deaths. And so it's it's a very complicated topic. Uh, and, and uh, you know, depends how far you want to go with this because we can talk for a while. But it's a it's a huge problem uh, that, that I think is... Um, it plays out in a lot of ways in our society, but we're, we're really seeing it laid bare with the pandemic. You know, I think that one of the challenges, you know, when you talk about the, you know, how it's been politicized is that, you know, people, part of it is people would prefer to believe that uh, COVID-19, certainly in the spring, people, their preference was to believe that it wasn't that serious. And when they were told it was going to go away or magically disappear, I mean, you, you want to believe that because yep. you, you certainly, you know, if someone told you in, in February of, of 2020 that, uh, you know, over 400,000, half a million people, and if, if, I mean, depending on what numbers you look at, and if you look at the unexplained death statistics, you know, that, that already half a million people have died due to COVID or uh, in some relationship to COVID. Uh, no one would have would have believed you. Uh, and not only that, can you imagine the reaction of the country? I mean, if we get upset about 9-11, which was justifiable in terms of being upset, uh, where several thousand people died, and now you have uh, more than 100 times that uh, already, uh, yet the reaction is, is almost subdued in comparison. To me, that's just kind of stunning, but, but there's certainly people who, as uh, the virus progressed and, and were told initially it wasn't serious or it was a hoax or it would go away. Uh, but they also saw uh, and can point to, uh, you know, Dr. Fauci, who's been a guest uh, on my program a few times, you know, saying initially, uh, it's, you know, it's not a big deal. You know, we're taking care of it. Uh, you had Democratic leaders who were encouraging people, whether it be Bill uh, de Blasio in New York or Nancy Pelosi in San Francisco, encouraging people to, you know, go to, uh, you know, go out and have, uh, you know, go to restaurants or whatever the case may be. And of course, a lot of that was a timing issue. A lot of that was how much did we know at that time. But people point to those kinds of examples. And, and as a result, they say, you know, why should we take this seriously? Uh, and, and you have uh, elected officials who will tell people, 
uh, you know, don't travel, things are really serious right now, and then uh, don't dine out, and then you know, 24 hours later, you have pictures on Facebook or whatever of these same yeah. people telling us what to do. So I, Do as I say, not as I do. Right. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you know, I think that a, a lot of our leadership uh, on both sides, uh, unintentionally in some cases, intentionally in, in others, have really undermined uh, you know, people's confidence in, in, in what they're hearing. And I think when you combine that with uh, a basic lack of understanding of how science works and that science isn't perfect uh, all the time uh, and that it's, it's something that hopefully progresses and gets more accurate over time, when you combine those two things, uh, you end up having, and, and maybe the U.S. on this scale is unique, uh, a huge percentage of the population uh, just not uh, believing that masks make a difference, that lockdowns make a difference, uh, or, or that uh, even while there are people dying around them, uh, that the virus isn't that serious. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at, you know, you, when you consider sort of what are our basic human needs, what do we all want? You know, we all want to be social and connect. We all want to have safety and security and health. And, and the pandemic is a real threat to that. So when you can dismiss the pandemic conveniently as a hoax or as fake news, you know, th that kind of explains a lot of where we are. So you've got, you know, on the one hand, the, the people that, that trust the science, that believe the science, who have gone in one direction and they're seeing no one and they are wearing masks when they, you know, open their front door when there's no one around. And then you have the other, the other end of the spectrum where you've got people who just that they are just going to dismiss all of it because that is going to fit in with their core human needs of, of you know, this can't be real um, because it's such a threat to, to you know, my well-being. Yeah, my favorite are people who are driving alone in their cars with their masks on. So that's... Yeah. Uh, uh, that's real commitment to to put price, it price. To, to put it mildly. What yeah, about? I, I don't want to discourage mask wearing by right. any means, but some of it, you know, you're not going to get it from yourself. So, uh, looking ahead right now, um, you know, we have a new administration in place. Uh, clearly, uh, completely different commitment in certain respects to uh, taking on uh, COVID-19 uh, in terms of vaccine distribution, uh, production. Uh, in terms of education, what what uh, what gives you hope uh, about this this new approach, and what elements of uh, the Biden policy and, and the Biden strategy uh, are you most excited about, uh, and and what kind of concerns do you have? Yeah, I guess you know I'll start with the concerns. The concerns is if he can, can if, if President Biden and, and the administration can convince the, the large portion of the American public that, that doesn't seem to be, you know, have belief that this is a problem at this point. I mean, there are still those people out there to, to convince them that, yes, it is a problem, because that is going to cross several domains. One is all of the, the physical distancing, the mask wearing, et cetera, that we need to continue to do for the next several months. And the other big part of that is acceptance of, of a COVID-19 vaccine. So those are those are sort of the two, the, the, the big things around concerns. Uh, otherwise, you know, outlining, outlining the plan, seeing what the plan says, I mean, it's what people within my world of, of public health have been saying all along. It, it really hits a lot of the, the major points of things that need to happen in terms of, you know, putting funding into vaccine distribution. Um, because that was, you know, Operation Warp Speed was a tremendous success in some ways uh, in terms of getting these vaccines, uh, you know, taking risk away from the manufacturers, getting that these vaccines developed, tested, shown to be safe and effective in, in really an unprecedented way. But there was no money allocated for the states to be able to deliver those vaccines. Um, and now, you know, we're seeing the results of that. It would be uh, I think generous to call the, the rollout uh, having you know hiccups. I think if there's been disasters in terms of, of how the, these vaccines have been rolled out because of a lack of, of uh, the ability to plan and get these in place. So you know the Biden administration has has laid that out as a big priority is you know helping the states figure out how to deliver these vaccines with a national plan. Um, so that you know that I think all of the things that I think 
you know, I don't, I don't see any anything lacking in the plans I've read about from the Biden administration. I think it's all there. You know, it's it's one. You know, can we make that happen? I think is the is the question at this point. In terms of making it happen and, and addressing what I think are really serious concerns about uh, vaccine, people who have vaccine hesitancy. I mean, there, there certainly is a significant cohort in the United States who, who don't believe in any kind of vaccines. Uh, and, and they have uh, objections, they have concerns. Uh, and if they're worried, their attitude is, I don't wanna take uh, a chance. And of course, we, we can discuss about you know, what information they get in the sources yep. of information. But there are also a lot of people who uh, are very hesitant and, and, and I think in a very rational manner say, hey, this is a brand new vaccine. We haven't seen anything created uh, on this scale at this speed in history. Uh, and although, you know, one can say, you know, testing, et cetera, was still very, you know, significant, very thorough, very well done. It certainly is reasonable for someone to say, whoa, this is happening so fast. I'm going to wait and see how this plays out. I'm going to, you know, after maybe 100 million people get vaccinated, let's see what kind of uh, reactions and responses uh, we get. And I'm talking about 100 million in the United States or some, some significant number. Yeah. You know, how do we, uh, how do we address those, those concerns, number one? And number two is, uh, you have an, an amazing number of medical professionals in the United States. I mean, literally millions of people with, some, you know, whether it be doctors such as yourself, you have a master's in, in public health as well. Uh, you know, th there are nurses, there are technicians, there are all kinds of people in uh, the healthcare system. Why don't we see more people in, in the medical field and scientific fields and healthcare fields uh, speaking out and informing, you know, their neighbors, their colleagues, uh, friends and family uh, about the realities of what's happening and, and what, what they need to do. I, I just haven't seen that kind of presence that I think would really be effective when, when people hear from somebody they know and trust. Yeah, well, I think we're doing the best we can, I'll tell you that. But, but the, the first, I guess, to your first point, I mean, you know, there's there's been this this sort of milieu of, of vaccine hesitancy going back, you know, really since the first vaccine, um, right? So that uh, Edward Jenner's vaccine in, in the late 1700s uh, was met with opposition within a matter of years. That you know there there were anti-vaccination groups, so, and and their concerns were essentially the same concerns as as now. You know, the vaccine's not safe. I don't need to get it because the disease isn't serious. Whatever. Those concerns have been around for, for many generations uh, and, and really haven't changed a lot since then. Now, what we have seen in the last uh, couple of decades that, that's new is the ability to spread misinformation and disinformation uh, very rapidly, uh, primarily uh, online through social media, et cetera. And so we've got that sort of existing milieu. Now, now I will say the fact is most most parents in the U.S. actually do get their children vaccinated, even though we do hear a lot about vaccine hesitancy and vaccine refusal. The really sort of rabid anti-vaccinationists re represent a very tiny proportion of the overall population. Um, roughly 99, less than 1% of, of U.S. children have zero vaccine, somewhere around 1%, um, depending on, on which year you look. Uh, so most parents are actually getting their kids vaccinated. Now, there are plenty of parents who have now have more questions than perhaps in the past based on some of this misinformation that's circulated. But that, that's exactly what they are. They're appropriate questions. And so their, their most trusted source of information is generally their pediatrician or their family doctor. And they get those question ans questions answered and they get, get vaccinated. Now we've got a different situation. And you, you bring up the very important point of like, okay, these are valid concerns, right? Like this is a brand, this is a new technology new vaccines that, that were tested in a very rapid fashion. How, why, why should I think they're safe? Um, and, and I think you're exactly right. I think we need, as, as scientists, as public health professionals, we need to get those messages out there. Part of the Biden plan does include um, getting those messages out there uh, from trusted sources. So that's another important point, is making sure that the source is trusted. So this is gonna be happening, it already is happening, to one degree or another at a national level with, for example, Dr. Fauci and, and folks at CDC trying to provide education. 
but then also at a very local level where uh, immunization coalitions, local and state health departments are working with trusted community leaders to get those messages out there. Uh, I, I mean, I can tell you, I, you know, for your audience, what I, what I will tell you is that uh, as someone who's, who's sort of had a front row seat to a lot of how these, uh, a lot of the goings on with these vaccines, um, these vaccines, although they, they were approved very rapidly, number one, the technology that uh, is going into the two vaccines that are currently out there in the US, the Pfizer and the Moderna products, those have actually been in development for decades, um, the, since, since the late 70s, 80s, and have been refined over, over the recent decades so that we were ready for the, those companies, those manufacturers, those scientists were ready for this moment. And so, that, so really it's not actually quote unquote new technology. Uh, the other point I would say is that although these happen rapidly, they happen rapidly for a very important reason. We have a, a we have extreme urgency to end this pandemic, and vaccines offer uh, the best way out of that. The the trials themselves actually were were essentially identical to the way that trials happen uh, um, with any other vaccine that may take several years to develop. They just happen in parallel rather than in sequence. And so that we, in fact, in these trials, there were more participants than there are in a number of vaccine trials. The final thing I want to say about that, though, is, you know, if people are concerned about uh, safety. The U.S. has had a robust safety surveillance monitoring system for decades that is monitoring the safety of vaccines behind the scenes, looking for any kind of adverse events. All of those are, have all of the, the, the existing ones have sort of stepped up their game a bit in terms of what they're going to be doing to monitor the COVID-19 vaccines. And then there have been a number of new safety surveillance mechanisms that have been propped up specifically because we're going to be rolling the, these vaccines out into large populations of people. So those are monitoring, as I speak, the safety of these, these vaccines. One of the interesting phenomena, though, uh, that I find is that for people with vaccine hesitancy who uh, and, and those who, uh, at least right now, say they, they do not want to or, or, or won't get the, get the vaccine, won't get uh, inoculated. Uh, there are a couple of interesting kind of uh, side effects uh, of that. Number one is, uh, given that there's a limited supply of the vaccine, it means that people who want to get vaccinated uh, may get vaccinated quicker uh, because there are people who qualify uh, to get vaccinated ahead of others who will not get vaccinated right now. So th those numbers will be replaced by people who are younger or people who are in, in, in less essential positions. Uh, and that will uh, allow us to, of course, use as many doses of, of the vaccine as, as are available, but at the same time, uh, build up significant numbers so that, that the people who took a pass uh, initially or who uh, had already decided they're, they're not going to get vaccinated. It's going to give them time to see uh, how this plays out and how yeah. effective it is. And also the efficacy when you have uh, for you know, Pfizer and Moderna at the 95% level, uh, when you have uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as a, you know, a one-shot uh, vaccine instead of two like the, the previous two, uh, I think a lot of people uh, over, you know, as, as 2021 progresses, a lot of people who have, you know, who, who are undecided or who are hesitant, I think you're going to see them move over to that, uh, to a decision, move to a decision that, you know, I, I need to get vaccinated. Um, in that vein, with uh, the, uh, the UK variant, uh, the, you know, B1117, uh, and others uh, as well that appear to be significantly more contagious, it's, it seems that to get to the point where we really get COVID-19 under control, whether you describe it as herd immunity or not, uh, where some diseases, if 40 or 50 percent of the population uh, is vaccinated or is immune due to exposure, that's sufficient. Uh, it, it looks like the percentage for COVID-19 could be 80 or 90 percent uh, as a target. That's a, that's a huge goal. Talk a, a little bit about that goal if you think it's achievable. 
Yeah, it, it's an important question. So, uh, you know, one of the things I didn't mention is just we should all be uh, you know, really celebrating and and promoting the fact that these vaccines, at least the, the two that are that are out there in the use use in the U.S. now, were incredibly effective. You know, ninety five percent essentially against any disease, essentially one hundred percent against severe disease. Um, this was a this was far higher than I think our, our most optimistic estimates. And so I think that is um, important because that's gonna play a role as we move forward for people understanding, okay, these are really good vaccines that, uh, you, you know, this is our ticket out of this pandemic. Um, in terms of the herd immunity question, you know, that remains to be seen. I, I do think that the, um, the the devastation that this pandemic has, has wrought, that uh, the, the, the lockdowns that we're seeing, all of the things that we can't do because of the pandemic, offer uh, you know sort of a, a, a weight on the balance of the scale to, to really do as you say. More people are probably going to jump on board, get vaccinated. You know, this is a more severe disease than than um, you know say influenza, which claims you know between five and 50,000 American citizens every year that we've blown way past that with this disease. And so some people were trying to equate, uh, people have, have tried to equate acceptance of this vaccine with acceptance of the flu vaccine. I think it's different. I think there's more of a sense of urgency for this virus than there is for flu. So I do, I am optimistic kind of as it sounds like you are, that acceptance will be uh, fairly high uh, when we look at the final numbers. Now, will we hit 85%, 90%, 95%? I don't know. The other, the other piece of this that's gonna be interesting to watch, uh, and you're already hearing a little bit about it, is you know, people talk about mandates. And, and it, you know, at this point, states and, and uh, the federal government are not mandating any of these vaccines, um, but the private sector may end up doing so, and other countries may end up doing so. So some of the things that, uh, um, you know, you want to travel, well, you need to have proof of vaccination, right? You, that you can see that happen. Um, and uh, I, I'm not saying that's necessarily a good idea or a bad idea, but things may go that direction. So you may have multiple things pushing people towards vaccination. The other big part of it is just the, the whole social norms around, around the vaccine. I think you know, most of the people that have been getting the vaccine have been very excited to get it. They're posting on social media, they're sharing their stories. Uh, there's a lot of pent up demand for the vaccine. That may also go a long ways towards promoting the vaccine as it becomes available to other segments of the population. Well, and, and I, th I think, again, what's interesting is given, uh, given the numbers and the fact that it, it'll take so long uh, to inoculate the full population, uh, the reality is, uh, you know, making sure that everybody who wants to get vaccinated can get vaccinated seems to be a, a reality in a not. Well, I guess it's a relatively short period of time. But, you know, to someone who who is waiting and has to wait till June or July, you know, to them, obviously, it's a, a long period of time. Uh, yeah, one of the things I want to talk about in your specialty is young people. Uh, and so I have a, a, a few quick questions. I mean, uh, from newborns to kids who are 17, uh, that comprises about 22% of, of the U.S. population. Uh, what's the status uh, of research uh, on that cohort? And, and I know you can break it down further within you know, diff different ranges, but the evidence seems to be uh, that, 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 that young kids, especially as they get younger, uh, not that they're impervious to the disease, but they seem to get it uh, less often or asymptomatically. Yep. Uh, talk about that, talk about the impacts on them, uh, and also uh, their ability to be contagious and, and, and transmit the disease. Yeah, so we'll, we'll start with that part. Um, so yeah, the, as you say, the, uh, the evidence at this point is showing that younger kids, generally the cutoff people have been using is around age 10 or so, depending on the study you look at, um, but it's probably a continuum actually, but uh, that, that younger kids tend to be less likely to both get it and less likely to spread it. And, and, uh, children, and, and, and you mean far less likely? Yeah, far less, it, it, but it's not like they don't get it. They, they certainly do and they certainly can spread it. I think that's one of the issues I think that's been a problem throughout this pandemic is sort of thinking of things in 
sort of binary or categorical terms. And so, you know, if you say kids are less likely to get it, then somebody will say, well, my cousin's little boy got it and she got it from him. And it's like, well, yeah, that happens. But it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that it's so. So it's not that it can't happen. It's just that it's less likely. Um, the, the other piece is that children of all ages, you know, are less severely affected by this this virus than adults. But that's not to say that this is a benign virus in children. So far, we've probably got roughly, as far as reported, over 200 deaths among children. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, although that pales in comparison to the overall, you know, roughly 400,000 deaths in the U.S., that's still a bad virus for kids. Um, and uh, many of those kids have chronic conditions. Some are healthy children. Uh, we've also seen, you know, at least 10,000 hospitalizations from this virus in kids. So it's not right to say that it's benign in children either. So we do need a vaccine for children to protect them, but we also need a vaccine to achieve in, in children to achieve this, this community protection or herd immunity that we're all hoping for. And so the, the, st the status at this point is um, Pfizer's vaccine is approved down to age 16. Um, and you know, so a handful of kids that are getting vaccinated at this point that you know, may work in medical offices or, or something along those lines. Um, but, you know, not, a, not ruled out in the general population of kids uh, uh, yet. Um, both Pfizer and Moderna are studying the vaccine at this point down to age 12 with plans to go further. Uh, the um, other manufacturers, my understanding is that, that Janssen, the Johnson & Johnson product is studying it in kids in, in other countries and is planning to do so in the U.S. Um, and, and the other manufacturers are also in the planning stages of these viruses. Within my role in the academy, in the American Academy of Pediatrics, we've really been trying to, to push hard to get these studies in children done with the same urgency that the studies in adults were done, uh, to, to really get them, um, get these vaccines approved in kids as soon as possible. Uh, of course, with the hope that we would get one achieve herd immunity uh, at, a, at an early phase, but also have kids uh, so that there's there's really no reason whatsoever to uh, not have kids in school and childcare uh, as time goes on. What any sense of why uh, medically or scientifically young people seem relatively impervious to to the disease? What's what's yeah, the yeah, that's a great question and one that's still being worked out. I think some, you know, the, the main hypothesis I've seen that's still circulating is one that, that came up early on is that children appear to have fewer of these uh, ACE2 receptors, which is the receptor that uh, the virus uses to gain entry to the cell. So that's kind of, that, that's one of the main thoughts. There's also some thoughts that maybe there's some cross protection from uh, other circulating uh, childhood coronaviruses that cause the common cold. Uh, other thoughts that uh, are, it has to do with maturation of the immune system because uh, our immune system changes as we age, but it's not entirely clear at this point. I'm a big proponent of opening schools and having kids go back to school in regular numbers uh, yeah. on the basis that we vaccinate teachers. Uh, obviously, the teachers are the ones who are most vulnerable and, and you can't blame someone for saying, hey, I, I don't want to go into a room full of 30 kids and, yeah. and who, who may be asymptomatic, uh, but can transmit the disease to me. Why don't we give teachers a much higher priority for getting vaccinated so uh, that we can open schools up normally, uh, which has all kinds of positive uh, ramifications for, for parents, for the economy, for the, the mental and, and economic health of the country. Absolutely. You, are not, you and I are on the same page. I've been very involved in the, the school-related issues since the beginning. I helped write the AAP's guidance, which says that the, the goal for planning uh, for opening of schools should be to start with having children physically present in school. Um, absolutely. I, I think there are so many downsides to having kids out of school, so many upsides to having them there. It's crucial. Um, now, in terms of the question, now teachers are considered essential workers uh, in the current frameworks. And uh, so they are, you know, in that, you know, one of the earlier phases, depending on which framework you're looking at and which state you're living in, uh, most places are prioritizing teachers. Um, and it's the, you know, in Colorado, I think that some teachers have already been vaccinated and certainly the, uh, any healthcare professionals that are working in schools have been, have been prioritized for vaccination. Uh, and, you know, they are, they're 
definitely towards the top of the line. You know, we just have very limited supply right now. Um, so, you know, absolutely, they they are essential and uh, should be prioritized. You know, the, figuring these things out, though, as far as who gets vaccine when is a very tricky calculus, and it's it, it's not it's by no means straightforward. Has the do you think uh, the fact that it hasn't been straightforward, uh, the fact that there have been so many different categories, uh, the fact that those the categories and priorities have changed sometimes due to the science, but also sometimes due to uh, political considerations. Do you think we've made some serious mistakes there and that it would have been better just to, to do it by age and start off and say, you know, everybody 80 and over, we're going to vaccinate, and then everybody 70 and over, we're going to vaccinate, and then 60 and over, and then the rest of the crowd, as it were? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky because the majority of deaths have been in the oldest Americans, but there have been, you know, tens of thousands of deaths in younger Americans as well. The virus is circulating much more commonly in the younger age groups, the 20 to 30 year olds, 30 to 40 year old, 40 year olds. Those are the places, those are the people where the most infections are. So do you focus on where the most infections are to prevent it from spreading to the rest of the community? Or do you focus on where the deaths are? Uh, it, it's and, and it's a balance, I think. And I think what most, um, you know, the, the policymakers that have been considering this that are not doing it for who's going to vote for me, that are doing it based on, you know, sort of the science and the ethics of it, uh, I, I think are trying to, to balance both of those sort of competing issues. The other enormous competing issue, of course, is the, the health inequities that have that are long standing in the U.S. that have really been exacerbated by this pandemic. And so those are considerations as well. Who, who's being the most heavily impacted uh, by this pandemic? Uh, and, and so, um, you know, trying to consider the equity uh, piece there as well has been, has been front and center on people's minds that are making these decisions. So there's no question that, that people of color have borne a grossly disproportionate uh, burden of the illnesses and of the fatalities. Uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, and a lot of that is related, uh, in, as you were uh, inferring, I mean, there's obviously a number of factors, the type of work people do that a lot of people who are frontline workers or who are exposed uh, are minority people, are people of color. Uh, you also have uh, the socioeconomic status where there certainly are households where you may have a large number of people. Uh, I think Southern California is a great example uh, where uh, it's so expensive, the housing is so expensive that you have a, a, a large uh, population of people where you may have you know, eight, 10 or 12 people yeah, living together. Yeah, multi-generational households, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, that's playing out. Is there any medical reason in terms of susceptibility uh, that anyone has identified? Um, no, it's probably, it, it appears, not at this point anyway, but it does appear to be, um, you know, tied with uh, socioeconomic status primarily, um, and, you know, health condition, underlying health conditions have, have played a role. And, and, you know, I mentioned that these health inequities are longstanding. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's very much true that, that a lot of the chronic medical conditions that put one at higher risk of severe disease from COVID-19 are disproportionately represented in communities of color. And so, and, and those are uh, essentially the results of longstanding uh, multi-generational poverty. All right, and, Sean, and I should say racism. Sean, I really appreciate your time. I wanna give you a, a chance to say, you know, give me a final comment, final word uh, for my viewers and my listeners. Is there anything uh, looking ahead at 2021 that, that you really feel is important for people to know uh, that we haven't covered. And I know we've probably covered more than either of us expected. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I guess what I would say is just around the vaccine, I, I think these vaccines, you know, I have been following vaccine policy for, for quite a few years now, um, very closely. I, you know, I work on vaccine policy. Um, I, I study the science. And, you know, I am comfortable with the process that took place in approval of these vaccines. I got the vaccine myself. Um, I will, you know, assuming they are shown to be safe and effective in kids, I won't hesitate to get my own kids vaccinated. Um, 
you know, I, your audience may not know me from Adam, but I, but I can tell you that personally, I'm very comfortable with the safety of these vaccines. And I, I think it's going to be really important going forward. You know, they, these vaccines are the, the clearest way out of this pandemic to get us through this thing. So, so I really want to emphasize, you know, if you, if you have questions, look for trusted sources. Don't look, you know, be careful what your sources are because uh, there's a lot of misinformation that's circulating right now. Uh, your your um, child's pediatrician or your primary care doctor can help answer those questions. CDC, American Academy of Pediatrics, Immunization Action Coalition, those are all excellent sources of information. There are a number of others, but, but be careful about the misinformation that's gonna circulate as well because it will. All right, Sean, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you very much. All right, that's the end of our program. Again, you can see this show uh, and listen to the program. Just go to harbortv.com slash vaccines, forward slash vaccines. That's harbortv.com. You can see it on your screen as well. All of our programs are available, uh, both in video and podcast form as well. And remember to send your questions. If you have any questions about vaccination, vaccines, uh, the COVID-19 virus, just send them to questions at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Aaron, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. Right now, everyone is stressed out, and some people really need extra support. This is the time to reach out to family, friends, and others. And if you or someone you know needs help or is in crisis, please contact any of these agencies. There are many people waiting to assist you and anyone else who needs help in these difficult times. Please don't hesitate to reach out now to help yourself and others. The Rex Al Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. Hi, I'm Aaron, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, new waves of criminals are trying to scam you with fake testing sites and phony home test kits, as well as insurance coverage, vaccines, and cures that don't even exist. Here are some resources you can use to protect yourself, your family, and your friends. Remember, if an offer sounds too good to be true, it probably is not true. Be careful and stay safe.
Hi, I'm Aaron Harbour. The goal of my show is to inform viewers about a diverse range of topics, from our country's leadership to economic and tax policies to energy and environmental issues, with the participation of the most significant stakeholders in each arena. Our long-form approach gives each guest the time to fully speak his or her mind and gives the audience all the facts, allowing everyone to draw their own conclusions. Thank God you do your homework, and, and just doing what you do is enough to begin to let them know what's happening. I strive to bring together guests with perspectives from across the entire political spectrum to promote problem resolution through civil discourse. Keith Overman and Glenn Beck and Rush Babe, frightening people and using emotion, fear, guilt, and racism. What a bunch from the right and the left. I've personally experienced our democratic system from the inside, and I use my knowledge and expertise on the show to get clarification of major points and expand the discussion to ensure my audience gets the uncut truth. What is this bigotry against a third party candidate? Do the two parties own all the voters and everyone else should shut up and stand in line? We were on the campus together at Princeton University. Her Majesty does not look any different than she did uh, in those days, and I wish I could say the same about myself. I'm an ardent supporter of transparency in government and strive to play an active role in bringing out all the facts related to our nation's most challenging issues. One of the things I've learned in life, and you certainly have learned from doing your show, you got smart people, but they're torn apart, they're polarized, you get into a media environment where it's not things like your show, but the shout shows on talk radio or cable TV, in which there's just this tendency to score political points and be polarized. Since my days in national talk radio, I've upheld a tradition of being truly nonpartisan, something which seems rare on the airwaves today. Depending on your point of view, a decision of the Supreme Court might be the wrong one. I've also found my guests talk to others involved in our nation's leadership, and they have encouraged them to come on the program as well. We are not final because we're infallible, but we are infallible because we're final. Now, no one knows what that means. But what, 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 what it means, I know, but what it, it means good. is we do not have the last word because we are so brilliant. We are, of course, brilliant, but only only in the sense that somebody has to have the last word. It's the focus on issues rather than personal attacks that makes guests comfortable and gives them the chance to tell their entire story. I simply let guests explain their perspective completely, then dig deeper for the audience by drawing from my own knowledge and experience. Democracy succeeds when you're giving more and more things to people, but the years ahead, we're gonna to have to ask more of them in taxes and expect less from government. There doesn't seem to be anyone in either party that has any kind of appetite for asking more of people tax-wise. Am I wrong about that? No, you're probably right, and that's a flaw in democracy. Thanks for taking the time to check out the show. I hope this has been helpful in illustrating the nation's need for a balanced, nonpartisan program to shed light on today's issues. For more information, please go to www.harbortv.com or email producer at harbortv.com. And thanks for watching.